All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Dorsa Sadek. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about how we use learning to enable and influence interactions with humans, interactions between humans and robots. And, and to talk about that, we first need to talk about interactions. So what are social interactions? Like, how do we think about interactions when it comes to, to humans coordinating with each other? And how can we use some of those ideas when it comes to human-robot interactions? So, so when, we, when we think about intelligent interactions, the first thing that we might remember is how two humans can coordinate and collaborate with each other. And humans are amazing at this. They easily come into each other's spaces and collaborate and coordinate with each other. And one common way of modeling human-human interaction is this idea that two humans can do a task together, like play a game of chess. And then the way they go about that can be modeled by this idea of theory of mind, which basically says, hey, each one of these agents is going to have some sort of representation or model of the other agent. And this other agent could be an opponent or could be a partner, but basically each one of these agents have a model uh, or a belief over what the policy of the other agent is, or maybe what the state of the other agent is. And, and this type of model, this type of game theoretic modeling is often refer referred to as theory of mind in human-robot interaction. And it also shows up in other fields, right? Of course, it shows up in game theory. It shows up in natural language processing as, as a rational speech act. In multi-agent reinforcement learning, this is often referred to as opponent modeling. And, and in general, like in all of these fields, it's pretty difficult to do it because it requires that recursive belief modeling that is usually not very scalable. So one way of addressing the, this type of formals and one way of addressing the scalability issue of this type of formalism is to approximate. And a common approximation is that instead of solving the full game, maybe we can solve the game until the nth time step and do nth order theory of mind. And, and that's a very common way of thinking about interactions between humans and robots, right? Like a human and robot are coordinating with each other. The human has a model of the robot and the robot has a model of the human. And then based on that, they can try to coordinate and collaborate with each other on a task. This type of paradigm is something that we actually used in the setting of autonomous driving. So this is a work from 2016, where we were looking at how an autonomous car interacts with a human-driven car. And, and exactly, we use ideas from theory of mind and, and game theoretic modeling to actually achieve that interaction. So, so specifically, we modeled the interaction as an underactuated dynamical system, where we said, well, the actions of the autonomous car, the robot car, is going to be an optimizer of the reward function, which is usually a function of state and actions, which is usual. But then to kind of capture this game theoretic type of interactions, we need to put in, well, how the human acts in this world. And the human, in this case, is a human-driven car. So that is UHS star. And a very good question to ask is, well, how does the human act in this world? And then the way we model the human is we model the human as an agent who is approximately optimizing some sort of objective, RH, which is their own objective. So a very good question to ask here is, what is this model of the human? What is this RH? And quite a bit of work in human-robot interaction goes through understanding and learning this reward function. So going back to this, this diagram, right? Like this robot has a model of the person. And I think it's a good question to ask, well, what is that model? And this is often a model of how the human acts in the world or how the human prefers a robot to act in the world. This could be human's preference model. And then we can capture that either through a reward function or, or through a policy. But either way, we need to have a model of how this human acts in the world or how this human want, wants, the, wants the robot to act in the world. So in the first part of the talk, what I'd like to talk about is to exactly talk about that issue. So how can we learn from interactions and how can we bring the human in the interaction loop, in the learning loop to better build representations uh, of, of the human model, to better build computational models of humans. And I'm going to very briefly talk about a few different projects and then get deeper in a specific project where we are learning from physical interactions. So that's my plan for the first part of the talk. And then for the second part, I'm going to go back to this idea of theory of mind modeling and, and talk about an orthogonal perspective to theory of mind modeling to, to, to enable interactions and influence interactions. But first, let's, let's talk about learning from interaction inter and interaction data. So, so this idea of learning from human data or learning from interaction data is, is Pretty, uh, pretty old, right? It has been around for like 20 years. And kind of the, mo the most classical, classical way of looking at this problem is, is this idea of learning 
from demonstrations. This, this idea of learning from demonstrations or learning from expert demonstrations has been around for a while and often referred to as imitation learning. So this is kind of the standard form of the problem where I bring in a person and the person provides expert demonstrations, like either through kinesthetic teaching or VR, or it can be through teleoperation, and then provides these expert demonstrations. And from those expert demonstrations on the robot, I'm going to try to learn either a policy or a reward function that captures what the human really wants or what is the computational model of the human. So, so this is a perfectly okay way of doing things, but the problem with this particular approach is that it relies on expert demonstrations. And we often don't have like that much data of expert demonstrations. And this is actually one of the problems of applying learning in, in robotics, right? The reason learning hasn't made the same sort of difference in robotics, as opposed to let's say natural language processing or vision is that we just don't have that large giant data sets. And then the question is, what can we do in this setting? And the idea that we've been thinking about is, is that we should try to go beyond expert demonstrations, and we should be careful about how we collect that data. So specifically, kind of threat in our lab is, is this idea of tapping into many different sources of data that are present and trying to leverage these many different sources of data to better learn these preference models. And, and, and specifically one direction that we are looking at is, is trying to look into other sources of data like suboptimal demonstrations. If you bring in a person to teleoperate a robot, they're often not going to be, be providing experts data. They're not often going to be providing optimal data. So what we are looking at is how can we learn from suboptimal imperfect demonstrations? And we actually have a work on this at ICRA this week, which is exactly focused on learning from imperfect demonstrations or demonstrations that are coming from agents with different dynamics or different embodiments. How could we use that data in order to better learn a rewards function of preference model? In addition to that, another, another direction that I think is pretty interesting is trying to look into learning from observation data, right? Like third person observations. We have a lot of videos of people doing various types of tasks like cooking on YouTube. If you can really tap into that data and learn from that, that would be really powerful. That would be really interesting. And, and I understand that's pretty difficult, but I think that's a very large source of data that, that's really exciting to try to leverage and try to use in, in these types of settings. Similarly, I think language is also a pretty interesting uh, direction that one could use for robot learning. There are large offline data sets of, of language. How could we tap into that data of, of language, um, language data? Or in general, how can we use language even in an interactive fashion, right? Like language instructions or narrations is a pretty interesting source of data that, that provides very different types of knowledge as opposed to, as opposed to demonstration. So, so how could we use language demonstrations, narrations as a way of uh, learning these preferences? And then another source of data that uh, in our lab we have been looking at over the past couple of years is this idea of pairwise comparisons or rankings. So, so this is also a very interesting source of data because it doesn't rely on expert demonstrations. It doesn't rely on someone coming in and teleoperating this robot. Instead, the robot by itself is automatically going to generate two different trajectories, maybe A and B, and then it's going to ask a user, well, which one do you prefer? Do you like A or do you like B? And then based on that response, it's going to automatically generate the next set of questions. So, so in addition to this idea that pairwise comparisons and rankings is, is an interesting source of data, you could also take an active approach to, to be careful about the specific type of questions and the specific type of feedback that we are getting from humans. And that can help us be a lot more efficient and effective in collecting our data from humans. Um, so we have a third of work on this domain, but specifically at ECRA, we also have a work on this uh, in collaboration with folks at Caltech, where we are looking at learning people's uh, walking gait preferences. So uh, when people are wearing these uh, exoskeletons, they have different, different gait preferences. And we're looking at how to query people to learn these particular preferences and, and learning nonlinear rewards in these settings, which again, I think querying people in this particular way is uh, and actively doing that actively and effectively can, can help us better learn humans' preferences in these settings. And, and finally, the last source of data that I actually want to get a little bit deeper in is, is this idea of physical corrections. So if you think about a robot, a robot is not an AI agent, right? It actually has an embodiment. And, and we can move it around, we can provide physical corrections. And a direction that we are looking at is 
thinking about how we can learn from a sequence of physical corrections. Like when you're providing a sequence of corrections, they're often interdependent. And how can we leverage that interdependency to better learn in models of humans or, or reward functions in this case? Uh, and this is also an ECRO work from, from this week, but let me talk a little bit about this in, in more detail. So, so, so what is the idea? The idea is that we have a robot and, 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 and where we have multiple robots, two robot arms in this case, and we can provide corrections on this robot, physical feedback on, on, on this robot. And every physical feedback that we are providing is going to correct something about this robot, but it's not going to fully correct and capture our preferences because the task could be pretty difficult. So because of that, we might end up providing a sequence of corrections and these sequence of corrections tend to be correlated. And the question we're interested in answering is how can we learn from these correlated sequence of corrections? So, so let me talk about this particular example uh, a little bit in more detail. So imagine that you have two robot arms holding a grocery bag and then the robots are um, basically like holding this grocery bag, helping you, helping you unpack the grocery bag. And they're, they're trying to put the grocery bag on either region, like on some somewhere somewhere on the on the table. And, and, and the robots think that, oh, it's okay to put the grocery bag anywhere. Maybe they, they would like to put the grocery bag on the green region. But the human might have a different preference here. Maybe, maybe, maybe the sorry, on the blue region. So, so maybe the blue region, it's wet, there's water there, and humans might have a slightly different preference. And maybe they really want the robot to put the grocery bag on the green region. So, so to do that, the human is going to provide corrections on the robot. So as the robot is acting, as the robot is following its trajectory, which is the, the, the black trajectory here, a human can come in and, and decide to basically move the robot arm. But the thing is we have two robot arms here and you can't really satisfy everything you care about at the same time. So, so what would be some of the things that you'd care about? So one thing you would care about is that the robots don't pull the bag too much or push the bag too much because there is stuff, you don't want to squeeze the stuff too much or you don't want to spread the bag too much. At the same time, you don't want to hit the obstacles. Maybe you don't want to hit that Stanford hat over there. So, so you end up providing corrections maybe one at a time. And by providing these corrections one at a time, you might violate some of your preferences in each one of these, these corrections. But all of them together are going to end up capturing what the human really wants. And from this sequence, we should really try to understand what the human really wants. So, so how do we go about that? So here's our formulation. So imagine that we have the robot and you have a human and the human has some sort of objective in their head. Let's try to capture that through a linear reward function where it's parameterized by a set of parameters theta. Okay, so, so the robot comes in having some assumptions over this theta. So, so maybe the humans, the robot's estimate of this theta is theta zero. So, so what the robot does is it comes up with a trajectory, which is an optimizer of, of this reward function that the robot thinks the human wants, and that depends on theta zero. Okay, so, so here is an example. Let's say that we have an apple and the apple should go in the fruit bowl and, and the robot follows trajectory psi r to do that. But let's say that it's a different day and someone moved the, 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 the fruit bowl to, to the second shelf here, to the, to, the down, uh, to, the, to the bottom shelf here. And maybe there's also a, a dinner plate here like in front of us. Okay, so then in this case, the optimal trajectory that the human really wants to follow is the green trajectory. That is really like what the robot should be following. But the robot doesn't know that, right? The robot is going to follow psi r because that is what it is trained on in different environments. And now we are in a slightly different environment, distribution, distribution shift in the environment. And, and now that trajectory psi r doesn't hold anymore. So what can the human do? The human, the human can come in and provide an intervention, right? Like actually provide physical corrections on the robot. And that particular intervention, that, that action, which is like the forces that the human is putting in, can actually deform the trajectory. And what we do is we, we take that action and we deform the trajectory using, using, using this particular deformation, which is based on a set of hyperparameters, mu and a. And, and that basically deforms the trajectory psi r to a new trajectory psi 1h based on that first intervention. But that first intervention alone kind of provides a potential intended trajectory but it doesn't capture everything that the human wants, right? Because this trajectory is ending up at the top shelf. The human really wants you to put the fruit, put the apple in the, in the fruit bowl in the bottom shelf. So, so this particular trajectory alone is not really going to capture everything. 
So, so instead, what we need to do is we need to provide a second intervention. So our second intervention is going to come in later. And based on that second intervention, that single force, we're going to again deform the trajectory. And, 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 and based on that deformation, we're going to get the actual intended trajectory. And, and we can similarly, like every single time the human provides an intervention, like a force intervention, we could use that to deform the trajectories and, and get these, these deformed trajectories as potential corrections. Okay. All right. So let's go back to what we wanted to do, right? Like, like we had this reward function parameterized by theta. The robot has an incorrect idea of what theta was. And the thing we want to do is we want to take these corrected, corrected interventions, these tra trajectories, this sequence of corrections. And based on that, we want to build a better estimate of theta because theta are the parameters of, of our reward function. So human corrections are coming in forces, but there is a corresponding, there is a corresponding set of trajectories for, for these human corrections in forces. So given that our observation model is in forces, right, like we could actually generate a sequence of deformed trajectories that correspond to that same observation model. And we're going to use these deformed trajectories. Uh, instead of actions, because that kind of helps us reason about like what the trajectories are and, and how the trajectories are, are generated. All right, so, so at the end of the day, my goal is really to find the probability of thetas, right? Like I, my goal at the end of the day is to have a good estimate of what thetas are, given the corrections that are provided by the human. AH is a sequence of corrections provided by the human and the original robot trajectory. Using Bayes' rule, I can just like write that out based on the prior and my probability of observations, which is probability of that sequence of trajectories, because now I'm going to use the trajectories given psi r, robots, robots trajectory, and theta. Okay. So that is the only thing I need to compute. So the question is, where does this come from? So the thing is, probability of the sequence of corrections that the human is providing is, is going to be proportional to some sort of objective that the human has in their mind. And that objective, the way we are writing that objective is, is based on this function D, which we refer to as accumulated evidence, which is a combination of reward of the trajectories, like how good each trajectory is, these are task rewards, as well as like the effort that the human is putting in in, in, in each one of these trajectories. Because human wants to minimize their own effort, so they're going to, they're going to put in as minimal effort as possible to generate that. And, and we're going to have set up hyperparameters to weigh these two together. So our learning rule is that probability of this sequence of trajectories is going to be proportional to exponential of this objective, the usual Boltzmann distribution model. Okay, so, so to compute that, well, we need, to, we need to compute this term, which has this denominator, which is a partition function. And this partition function, like usual, is, is very difficult to solve. So instead, what we do is we make a set of approximations, specifically we do a Laplace approximation, to, to have an approximation of the denominator. And you still need to solve this denominator, and then solving this denominator ends up becoming a mixed integer optimization that needs to be solved. And, and we, we formulate this as a mixed integer optimization to solve the denominator and eventually solve this observation, solve for this observation model, which is probability of again corrections in trajectory space given, given our current theta. And once we have that, then we can go back to our base rule and we can find the new probability, our posterior probability of theta given the corrections. And then we have a model of the reward function and we can go from there. Okay. All right. So let's see how that works in practice. So here we have a, we have a user study where we brought in uh, this particular user. And what we are looking at here uh, are the plots, two plots here. So one is our independent baseline, which is I'm going to treat each correction that the person is providing independently. I'm not going to worry about the fact that there are these, these are sequences that correlate and depend on each other. And then we have our model, which captures this independent and uh, this interdependence between, between the trajectories. So, so it actually considers a correlation between the trajectories. And then on the y-axis, we are seeing belief over our theta. So, so we have uh, theta star, which is um, the, the really the, the preferred true human model, uh, which is shown by the darker colors. And then we have theta one and theta two, which are two other two other reward functions that, that one could um, optimize over. So the human is providing corrections, and over time, the, our belief over theta 
changes. And as you can see, like the darker color is really the true preferred model. And as you can see, the sequence model is going to capture the fact that um, the human's preferred model is theta star, as opposed to the independent model where you capture, you're capturing the, these corrections independently. And then that approach actually captures that theta one is the preferred is the preferred reward function and doesn't correctly capture theta star being, being the preferred reward function. All right, so if you're interested in this, uh, there is a micro paper on it. Feel free to read or feel free to um, go to the go to the session and uh, we can talk about it at a session if you're interested in, in this work. All right, so just let's summarize what we have talked about so far. So, so we've been talking about this idea of learning from interaction. So bringing the human in the learning loop. And we've talked about many different sources of data that exist and how we can be active about it, how, how we can intelligently collect data, and specifically how we can learn from physical corrections, physical interactions that humans provide to better learn models of humans, to better learn human preferences. And that kind of gives us this side of the equation. So, so let's go back to our theory of mind modeling. So if you remember our theory of mind modeling, we had, at the end of the day, we had the human and robot trying to coordinate with each other. And the robot needed to have a model of the human. And we've talked about that model so far. But how does the interaction part of it work? And, and as I was talking about earlier, right, like I talked about this describing example, and I talked about the fact that we have this nested game that happens between the autonomous car and the human driven car, and we still need to actually solve that. And solving that requires approximations that I was talking about earlier, because this recursive belief modeling is really difficult. So we either assume humans are fixed, or we assume that we can cut the game at, at some time step. And even based on that, we end up getting very interesting results. For example, in this driving example, we ended up getting very interactive behaviors where our autonomous car acts kind of like this white car when it tries to change lanes. It, it, it starts nudging in and kind of like it influences other drivers, like this black car in this case, to slow down and make room for it in order to kind of like Finish, finish this merging in behavior, which is a very interesting type of behavior. It's a very interactive type of behavior. And the only way to achieve it is to actually have a model of the human. Because like, if you don't have a model of the human, if you don't do this type of, this type of partner modeling, uh, a behavior that you might end up getting could be, could be similar to what we see in this video, uh, which is that the vehicle starts off um, so this is somewhat an old video, but, but basically, yeah, this is a video of a Waymo car where it starts off and it wants to change lanes, it signals, but through its actions, it's, it's not doing anything interactive, right? Like it doesn't, it doesn't really like model how to be assertive and how to, how to act in an interactive way with the other agents, with the other cars. And because of that, it's not able to like finish the maneuver and, and it needs to exit, come back around and try again, which, which is not very ideal. So, so theory of mind, it, it's, it's powerful. It actually like works when you, when you pair up humans and robots. It's, it's a perfectly fine way of modeling interactions uh, when it comes to thinking about um, these types of, these types of um, difficult interactions that require game theoretic modeling. But for the rest of this talk, I actually don't want like, to don't, don't talk about theory of mind. I want to talk about an orthogonal perspective to theory of mind. And the reason I want to talk about that is I'd actually like to argue that there are a lot of interactive tasks that are not like playing chess. They're actually pretty different than playing chess. So an example of that is maybe like a construction task where I have two people, let's say Alex and Bob here, coming together, trying to like build some sort of structure together. In this case, I really don't think Alex is thinking, well, I wonder what Bob's beliefs over my policies are. Like, I, I really don't think that's how, that's how it, the coordination works. So, but I really think what happens here is that Alex and Bob are really good at capturing the right representations that they need to keep track of, right? Like, and we often have names for these representations. You might call them intents or goals or roles. And, and, and we're really good at capturing what that is and then capturing a good estimate of it over time. So um, you might at this point say, well, what is the big deal, right? There is quite a bit of work in human-robot interaction, like trying to do belief modeling over intents, right? Like, like that's like we have also done some work around that. Like, what is the point that, that I'm trying to emphasize here? The point that I'm emphasizing here is not that there is a space of intents, let's do belief modeling over that. My point here is that I don't even know what that space is. I don't even know if it is called intent. 
let me try to learn, let me try to directly capture the right representations that I need to, I need to do belief modeling over. So let, let me figure out what is the space of intents or whatever we would like to call it. And, and by that, uh, what I mean is there is, I really think here in, the, in this setting, there is a low dimensional representation. There's a low dimensional latent representation that kind of captures this interaction, this coordination between the agents. And we just need to figure out what that representation is and, and, and try to understand how that representation changes over time to capture how people coordinate, collaborate with each other, or even influence them use, using that representation. And again, the reason I think there is a representation here and people don't do theory of mind modeling is that one thing I know about humans is that they're bound and rational. They're not going to be able to capture these high dimensional belief structures. And because of that, I don't think they're doing recursive belief modeling when it comes to many of these interactive types of tasks. I do think they're doing recursive belief modeling for some other tasks, but I think there's, there's a space of a space of other sets of tasks that don't really require that. And, then, and I think it would be interesting to think about learning these low dimensional representations in those spaces. All right, so let me, let me talk about that. So, so and that kind of what brings me to this idea of learning and influencing interactions and specifically learning these, these latent representations of the other agents' policies. So we've started looking at this idea of learning other agents' policies um, in, in a specific setting of playing the game of air hockey. So, so we have uh, two robots, let's call them an ego agent. This is our robot, this is our learning agent. This is the robot that needs to figure out how to do the task. And then we have another robot that we call other agent. And the reason we're calling it other agent is this, this setup doesn't necessarily rely on cooperative or competitive settings. It can actually work in either setting. So let's just call it other agent as opposed to like opponent or partner. And then they're trying to play a game of air hockey. And, and this other agent, it's, it's not a learning agent. It has a policy. And its policy basically is, is kind of like uh, the, the joint velocities of, of the robot. But at the higher level, like what, what the robot is trying to do is it's trying to push the puck either to the, to the center or left or right. Like at the higher level, it's, that is what it is trying to do. And what the ego agent observes is, is a trajectory. And that trajectory is a sequence of states and the ego agent's actions, ego agent's own actions, and then the reward that it gets. So like, was I able to block the puck or was I not able to block the puck? And it doesn't see anything about that, that, that policy of the other agent, not at a high level, not even at the low level. The only thing it sees are states and its own actions, okay? And what is the policy of the other agent? As I said, like it's, it's often like this high dimensional thing of figuring out what the robot should do. But, but at the high level, if I want, you want to understand like a high level uh, understanding of what the other agent is doing, it, it, it is following a policy based on this F function. And, and it is basically what it is doing is if, if the puck is being blocked at the previous time step, it is going to change its direction. So if it pushes the, block, the puck to the, to the left, and then the ego agent blocks it, at the next time step, it's going to push it to the right or center. So at the high level, that is what it is doing, okay? So what are we trying to do? What we're trying to do is we're trying to see if the ego agent, based on just observing the states and then its own actions and reports, can it learn a representation of the policy of the other agent that corresponds to this, this high level understanding of what the other agent is doing, that corresponds to all moving left or right or center. Could it, could it just learn that by just observing, observing interaction data? So, so how can we do that? So, so the way we are doing this is by training an autoencoder type structure, where we are looking at a sequence of data, a trajectory sequence of data, and we're trying to encode that sequence to a low dimensional representation that we're calling ZK. So, so ZK, we're calling this latent intent. And, and this is really an estimate of that at Z that I was showing earlier. So, so, so it's not truly Z, it's an estimate of Z, okay? And this estimate of Z that we're calling latent intent is what the ego agent thinks the other agent is going to do next. Like, like this is what it thinks the other agent is, is following. And, and, and how can we learn that? Well, the way we can learn that is by uh, decoding this Z to predict the next sequence of data. So our loss function is a prediction loss. So look at the previous interaction, try to predict the next interaction. And the only thing that kind of like the ego agent needs to predict the next interaction 
is, is to know what the other agent is doing, like, like to understand what the other agent's policy is, right? Like to have a representation of the other agent's policy. And then we are enforcing that that representation be low dimensional. So it is learning a low dimensional latent representation of the other agent's policy. And once we have this latent intent or latent representation, we can actually use that in, in planning, right? So, so we have this algorithm called learning and influencing latent intent, which uses a representation Z uh, within a reinforcement learning loop. And what it tries to do is it tries to maximize the expected return within an interaction. And through that, it's able to react to the other agent. So what we're doing is we're maximizing an expected return. And this expectation is over the policy of the ego agent, which is probabilistic. And it also depends on Z, which is the estimate that it has learned through representation learning. So together, as we train this reinforcement learning and representation learning together, we are able to do partner modeling. We are able to better coordinate with the other agent. And then let me actually show how that works in practice. So here again, we have uh, the setup where uh, the other agent pushes the puck. And, and, and then by pushing the puck, if you are able to block the puck, you're going to get a reward of plus one. And then um, you're artificially making this. So if you push the puck, to the left, you're going to get a higher reward. So you're going to get a reward of plus two if the puck is pushed specifically uh, to that direction. Okay. So if you train this robot through soft actor critic, soft actor critic eventually, after like a number of hours of training, two hours of training, it learns that if it if it goes to one side, it is going to be able to block the puck. If it goes to the right, it's going to be able to block the puck. And then eventually, after four hours of training, it realizes that well, going to the left is actually better. So it always goes to the left because that's the best thing that it can do. By always going to the left, it is going to get a success of around forty percent. So forty percent of the times, it gets lucky and it's able to block the puck. Okay. So then we have our algorithm, Lily, that actually does partner modeling. And through partner modeling, it is actually able to block the puck no matter where the puck is pushed towards. And because of that, it is going to get 90%, 90% success rate. Okay. So another interesting thing that I want to just briefly mention is, is that we could actually do better than this. And specifically, going back to this, to the, to this formalism that we have, instead of maximizing the expected return within an interaction, we can have another sum here that maximizes the expected return across multiple interactions. And by doing so, instead of blocking the puck, um, like instead of blocking the puck no matter where it goes, we can even influence the other agent to most often push the puck to the to the left because remember going to the to the left uh, was better so that kind of like uh, that this approach through Lily can actually influence the other agent to to act in specific ways and push the puck to the left so in terms of success rate it's going to be similar to no influencing but the interesting thing is with influencing we are going to be able to get the puck more often to the left which is which is more interesting so the takeaways here is that human partners or other agents, they're often non-stationary, they change their behavior, they don't have a fixed policy. And, and, and this type of, of non-stationarity can be captured through a low dimensional latent strategy as we have shown here. And our, our, our approach Lily anticipates the partner's policies using latent strategies and through that it can react and influence to the other agent's policies, okay? All right, so let me just summarize and try to wrap up here. So I've been talking about learning from interactions using different sources of data to learn from interactions and, and learn a reward function. And in the second part of the talk, I've been talking about the fact that this model that you learn from the other agent from interactions, it's not stationary changes. And we need to capture those changes. And one way of capturing those changes is, is through this idea of low dimensional representations, using low dimensional representations as an orthogonal perspective to theory of mind to do better coordination and collaboration. So very briefly as future directions, some, some set of directions that you're looking at is taking this idea of representations a little bit further and considering repeated interactions. So something that we have been looking at is these repeated interactions through collaborative games. So if I have Alice and Bob playing a game together where each one of them have a block, maybe Alice has a blue block, um, block and Bob has a red block. And if they're trying to build some sort of goal configuration, how can they do that by over repeated interactions, over repeated experience. So the setup is we have partial visibility where Bob sees everything, right? Like Bob sees the full configuration, but Alice doesn't really see 
in the full configuration. And it's a collaborative setting. But through repeated interactions, Bob, through its actions of putting the red block at the top and then pushing it to, to, the, to the bottom here, it is signaling to Alice where Alice should put its own blue blue block. It should put it uh, here. And then the only way Alice knows that is through repeated interaction, through multiple interactions. So what we are looking at is figuring out how we can build these types of these types of uh, AI agents and these types of robotics agents that can actually play similarly and build these conventions with other agents, again, using this idea of low dimensional representations. So specifically, what we have been looking at is a modular structure where we separate out partner specific representations and task specific representations. And through this modular structure, you're able to better learn, um, better learn um, like uh, low dimensional uh, representations of the other agent. And, and we've kind of like shown this, so, so we have some preliminary results on uh, this in an Eichler paper this year. And we have shown this working in um, a collaborative multi-arm bandit game, as well as a block stacking, like a block placement game, as I was talking about earlier. And, and, a, and a version of game of the game of Hanabi. So, so we've looked at this, this modular approach that I've been talking about, um, as well as a few different baselines, including first order mammal, um, and our approach is better at adapting to new partners. So why am I talking about this? Well, the reason I'm talking about this is I think this idea of adaptation and repeated interactions is incredibly important when it comes to uh, robotic systems. So remember this example I was talking about, like if you cut in front of someone that is Sure, that's a perfectly fine thing to do for that single interaction, but that can actually make this person really angry and this person might decide to come back around and try to get ahead of you later. So how are we going to like model that and how are we going to capture long term repeated interactions, I think is a pretty interesting question. And it becomes even more important as we think about putting a fleet of autonomous cars on the road and thinking about the effects of a fleet of autonomous cars on the road. So this is something that this is another thread of work which um, which is the topic of another talk, uh, but, but we are looking at some of these more long-term types of behaviors and setting up driving and, and how can we, how can a fleet of autonomous cars affect behaviors like uh, traffic congestion on roads and how can we get better equilibria if you could, if you could influence people if, like in, in, a, in, a, in a better way through these repeated interactions. So uh, with that, um, I would uh, just like to summarize. So I think interactions are incredibly important. I think learning plays a huge role here. So we could learn from interactions, we could use learning to enable interactions. And I think repeated interactions are super important to consider when we are, as you're putting these robotic systems in our everyday lives. So with that, I'd like to thank the group